I know a lot of you watching home shows and interior design programs and YouTube snippets about home are either looking to be inspired to change something in your own home or perhaps looking to completely redo your own home, whether it's a rental property or whether it's one you own. So I thought I would really love to come on here and talk about whether or not you actually need an interior designer and whether or not you can do it on your own. And the simple answer is yes, of course you can do it on your own. There are many, many ways in which you can do that. I'm just going to come on here and give you my view about the best way that you can do that. If you have not already liked and subscribed to my channel, please do. I love making these videos for you, but of course I love it even more when the subscriber number is going up and I see that lots of people are liking the videos. It's just more inspiring to do more. Let's start with the first step, which is what really is interior design. And the reason I'm starting you there is because that is the difference between really good design and bad design. And it's something that probably many interior designers know, but starting out as someone who perhaps is just doing your own home or, you know, a space in your home, you won't necessarily have thought about in the same way. Interior design is about experience. And you may have heard that before, but I'm going to explain to you what that really means. What we are doing as designers is creating a state change. So when you walk into a room, any room in your house, you should immediately feel like you have walked into a completely different environment that changes your emotional state. So it changes literally the way that you feel. And it should be so well done that you don't even know that's happened. And that's great interior design. So now, how do you recreate experience? How do you create this experience that you're supposed to feel in every single room, in every different space? Well, the key is to know what kind of experience you're looking to create right from the start. You know, it is a little study. You cannot just rush into interior design. There are two different types of people when it comes to design. There are those who will really over overthink and they won't design anything because they'll be so worried about doing it wrong. And there are people that just rush in and want to act. And you might be one or two of those, and even designers are more likely to be one or the other. But the key is to step back initially and, you know, maybe even get yourself a pad and a pen and write down what it is you are trying to create in every different space. So if you break down what I've just said, it is about the result. It is about the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And in everything in life, it's a great lesson to learn to always look at what the outcome is. You know, what are you trying to achieve within every single action that you're making? When you are coming down and writing what you want to achieve in each space, you are thinking about the outcome. So I'm going to give you three examples. I'm not going to go through every room in the house, but I'm going to give you three rooms that I think will be, or three spaces that I think will really interest you and will be perhaps your main focus. Okay, and I'm going to start with another set of questions. But the first room I'm going to take you through is the living room. And I think the reason I'm starting with the living room is because all of us want the best living room possible. It is often the biggest space in the house and one that we really want to make most use of because we generally are there a lot of the time. It could be the living room or the kitchen, but for most people, it's the living room. Okay, so my three questions for you are what, how, and who? So when I say what, I am meaning what are you trying to achieve in this space? Is the living room a space that you want to rest in? Is it a place that you want to play with your family or your kids in? Is it somewhere that you'd like to read? Is it a space that you would like to entertain in? Is it a space that you might end up having a meal in and watching TV? You know, let's be realistic about what we do with these rooms. Most people like to think that they sit in the kitchen or at their dining table, but sometimes you might have a meal watching TV in your living room or your kids might grab a snack and come and sit and watch something or come and talk to with a snack. So really take that all in and understand what that space is going to be for you. It's also really important to be realistic and to ask yourself, what is every person in my family going to do? So what I usually do is write down the members of the people in the family and who is going to use it in what way. And honestly, designers can do this for you as a start, but you, even if you've got a designer, should do this for yourself because no designer knows your family like you know your family. Okay, so that is the what of the living room. Now we go to our next question, which is how? How are you going to achieve getting that experience of the play, the communication, the unwinding, the eating potentially, the watching TV, the lying down? How are you going to create those experiences and the ability to have them in that space? 
If you were trying to create a restful or a relaxing environment, then there are so many studies online that you can find that will give you information about the type of thing you can do to create a restful environment. But just to give you a couple of tips, color is really important. It is a very important sensory way to be able to think about how you can create relaxation in your space. There are colors that emulate nature that are really great for relaxation. There are different fabrics that might allude to nature that would be great to use. There are different textures that for you may enable you to feel more like you're in a natural environment. So consider all of those things, but also consider layout when you're thinking about relaxation or being able to unwind because if you've got a very cluttered space and it's difficult to be able to lay down if it's difficult to be able to have a space where you can lie down and others to actually be in the same space then that's something you also have to think about so it is much more detailed than just thinking about you know let me make a lot of neutral colors and put them all together and that's my relaxing space it may be that the way that you've put those neutral colors together doesn't for you inspire nature and so it's really important to be specific and to be clear about what you require and what your family requires. I personally, in my living room, love the feel and energy that some natural timber has. I also love to have baskets in and around the house. For me, that feels very sort of natural and rustic. And I always add fresh flowers into my living room. That for me really does inspire the outdoors. I also really like to have lots of large spaces for which myself and others can relax at the same time because I always feel like if I'm the only person able to relax in that space, then I can't have my family around and that in itself doesn't relax me. I've said this before, but if you are trying to inspire communication, whether it's with a partner, your children, or other people that you have in your home, try to make sure that you have spaces where there are chairs and seating where one person is facing the other. It sounds so basic, but many, many times you'll see a living room where everybody is sort of lined up facing the TV, or where you've created the TV as such a focal point that even if you're not lined up staring at the TV, that is the main attraction. If you are somebody that likes to play, either playing games with friends that come over in the evening with a partner, or you want to play games with your kids, whether they're board games or other games, then some really easy ways to do that. You can have lots of storage to store away lots of games that you might play with your kids that you don't particularly want out all the time. You can also, of course, buy really beautiful sets of, for example, backgammon or chess that you can have on display and actually have that as a part of the whole scene. If the TV is a main focus of the living room and there is nothing wrong with that, then create cozy spaces and create sort of, you know, relaxing environments where you can just settle down and watch together, watch as a family, watch on your own. But again, if you're watching as a family and you love movie nights, make sure there is enough space in front of the TV that everybody feels comfortable watching together. My family love movie nights and we have a super duper long sofa um, sitting in front of the TV because nobody wants to be on the side or on the corner and everybody wants to snuggle up together. So if you are that kind of family or you want to lie down on a long sofa and have your partner next to you, make sure you've got the space. Now, one thing that I think most people don't think of is their daily life with their family and their interaction. I'm going to give you a small example, and this may not be it for your family, but there will be some little specific things that happen in your family that maybe don't happen in other families, but you can cater for that if you think about it enough in advance. My five-year-old boy loves to give us little performances. He calls them presentations. And obviously at school, they are teaching him to do presentations so that when they get bigger, they're confident and they're able to do them. And he loves to stand up and he doesn't really care what he's presenting, but he wants a little stage. Now, if we don't have that little stage, then he'll end up on the coffee table. So what we try to do is always make sure our coffee tables, though I love a large coffee table, are not so big that we can't shove them out of the way and give them a little bit more space. But also, we make sure that the coffee tables aren't actually very heavy, because if we are shoving them out of the way all the time when he comes home a couple of times a week and wants to do a presentation, we'll all end up with a bad back. It might seem so insignificant, but it means so much to him that he stands in the living room and gives us all his weekly presentation. So if your family have some small little quirks like that, then make sure you cater for them. It is those things that really bring family life together and that make a home what it really should be, a brilliant experience. 
Okay, so now we get on to who, and we've of course touched on this, but just to bring it right to the forefront, when you're talking about who, you are thinking about every single person in your family, and then you still haven't finished off the work. Because what you also have to think about is who regularly comes to your home? Who are you most concerned about being comfortable in your home? Now, I personally have a very small group of friends, a group of very, very close friends, and their comfort to me means everything. But at the same time, my mum, who doesn't come that often, when she does come, I want to be super comfortable. Otherwise, 20 minutes later, she'll be racing out the door. So, you know, think about your family members. Who are they? What do they need? You know, my daughter, for example, loves to sing. So again, she's a little performer and wants to stand in front of us in the living room and, you know, do a great song for us. My mum, who is, of course, older, wants to be comfortable. She doesn't want to sit in the same space and be uncomfortable. So I need to know what makes her comfortable, whether it's a particular chair, whether it's a particular area that she needs to sit in. All of those things are important to me. It's not necessarily thinking about the guests that come once a month, uh, once every few months, the new people you meet, although they are important, they may not be as important to you as the people who are really getting a regular experience of your home. And for me, that's my family, my very close group of friends, and my mum who doesn't like to sit still. So getting her to stay in one space is really important to me, especially if it's in my home. Okay, now let's move on to bedrooms. And now I'm not going to go through with you each bedroom because there's a master and the kids' bedroom and the guest bedroom, but I will go through the major principles with you. From a bedroom perspective, we need to think about more than just sleep, although sleep is incredibly important. So let me start there, but I'm going to take you through more than just sleep. Sleep is clearly incredibly important for your health and it's something I don't want to skip past lightly, but I'm not going to tell you about the science of sleep, but I am going to tell you what I know inspires a better environment for sleep. We know for a fact that sleeping or not sleeping properly impacts your daily life. So it really is incredibly important to think about. And there is a whole science on sleep and the things that you can do to inspire better sleep and to encourage sleep. What we do know is that your bed, the mattress you choose, the linens you choose, the pillow you choose, that can all either overheat you, that can cool you, and it is very, very specific and unique to you. So you need to find out what those things are for you. Don't just go for a mattress or a pillow that you're used to having or that you think is the best one. Really research what it is that might improve the way that you sleep. It is so crucial to your life that it's something that you should not miss out on. There are mattresses, um, I think now, that actually will cool one side of the bed and have another side of the bed slightly warmer if you and your husband have different body temperatures, which of course is completely natural. So think about things like that because it really is worth looking into. It may also be that you particularly have some allergies or you are more prone to allergies. So there are non-allergic materials and fabrics. There are fabrics that you may have more sensitivity towards. There are fabrics that are much more natural than other fabrics. So, you know, really do give this some thought before making a decision. The other thing that is not conducive to sleep is to have too much stimulation in a space. So if you've got a lot of things on show that you feel may stimulate you, maybe consider having them more concealed. Maybe think about the colors that you've got in a room that might stimulate better sleep rather than stimulate more wakefulness. Those colors, those things may be different for different people. So again, very unique to you, but something that you really must think about before designing your room. The other thing we know that is helpful is lighting. Now think about your lighting in your room. If you don't think about it anywhere else, your bedroom is the place to think of it because there are definitely some lights that will not allow you to sleep as well as other lights. Again, this is a whole science on its own. Do some reading about it. Think about which lights are going to allow you to wind down more easily. Think about the lights that you shouldn't be looking at before bedtime. I mean, we all know, for example, we shouldn't be looking at our phone before bedtime, but of course most of us do. So Knowing that that is a habit, try and build that in. So rather than having, for example, your charger close to you in your room, make sure that around your bed there are no electronics and actually you'd have to go perhaps to another room or slightly further away to actually be able to get access to your phone. So just think about your daily habits and what you can do to improve them, especially when it comes to a lighting perspective. Another interesting thing about lighting that I found has really affected me is that I wake up a lot in the middle of the night. I will go to the bathroom in the middle of the night 
the moment I switch on the light in the bathroom, I've got an on and off switch, I don't have a dimmer, I am in full wakefulness mode. And so what I do now, because I don't want to change all the electrics in my house, is I have a small light just outside the bathroom, which I open up, it's a small lamp light, and I switch that on and then I go into the bathroom. So it's not ideal, it would have been much better to have a dimmer, but I don't want to switch on the light in there because it completely wakes me up. So if you know that you've got a problem with getting back to sleep in the middle of the night, make sure from a lighting perspective you've catered for that moment when it comes. Okay, sleep is not the only thing you do in your bedroom, so think about what you do. Do you like to cuddle up with your children and read a bedtime story to them? If you do, whether that's in your room or their room, is their bed big enough to allocate both of you so that you can read a story to them? Or are you always falling off the edge of the bed? Is their pillow big enough that you can lie back on the bed with them and actually read a story properly? If you are in your bedroom, do you like to have a nice warm drink before you go to sleep because again that might be something that enables you to enhance the way that you sleep and the way that you wind down. If that's the case, is it a possibility that you might be able to build in some kind of a kettle, maybe a fridge? Do you need to wake up in the middle of the night and go and get yourself a bottle of water? Would it be more conducive to your sort of wakefulness to be able to have some water or an allocation in your room when you can have a water, a cup of hot milk or a cup of boiled water or tea or chamomile or whatever that is to get you back to sleep. Those things are things you should think about. I hate going downstairs in the middle of the night when, for example, I've got a cold or a sore throat and I want to have a cup of tea or a hot chamomile, I'd rather a tea, in the middle of the night. So I love the fact that I've got a kettle in my room and I can make myself some chamomile or just hot water and then go back to bed. Do you like to relax, have a conversation, communicate when you are in your kind of bedtime space? I use that moment to actually sort of get rid of all my thoughts that are going through my head and I need them out before I get into bed. And so I prepare myself by having some notebooks in my bedside table. I actually have enough space to have somewhere to sit in the bedroom so that I can have that conversation that I need to have before I go to bed. Think about those things. You know how you use that space and you probably also know how your kids use their bedroom. So make sure you cater for yourself, for your kids, for other family members, for guests. And each space is going to be completely different if it's well thought through. I also get dressed very close to my bedroom, so I need to make sure that there's a real disconnect between bedroom and dressing room where I feel invigorated and refreshed when I'm in my dressing room, but also that I'm not so invigorated and refreshed that I can't then wind down when I get into my bedroom. And for me, that meant creating a dressing room that really felt very outdoors, very nature-like, very calming, but still refreshing and inspiring. Now let's get to the how of what you do in your bedroom. If, for example, you're designing your children's room and you know that one of your kids likes to have sleepovers or you know that one of your children likes to have you sleep by them in the middle of the night or you like to sleep by them if anybody gets sick at night, then maybe have, you know, okay, you might have a single bed for your child, but maybe have a pullout underneath the bed so that you can prepare yourself for future sleepovers or for the days where though we'd like not to think of them one of our kids gets ill or has a fever and that we need to be there for them and we don't necessarily want to disrupt our partner or husband's sleep whilst we're doing that. So just making sure you accommodate for small things like that. Make sure you know what it is you're trying to achieve and then the solution is always very close by. Again, we've touched on this, but who are we really using that space for? For me, in my kids' room, yes, it is their room, but I need to participate with them in that room. So I need to be reading stories to them. I always like to go and have conversations with my kids just before they go to bed. I feel that's when they're sort of at their most vulnerable and when they really want to open up and talk to me about certain things. So I make sure there's somewhere for me to either sit on their bed with them or somewhere close by enough to have a conversation. Are they going to have friends? in their room at some point as they get older are they going to want to invite their friends into their room if that's the case where is the friend going to sit what are they going to do thinking about that in the future proofing the activities and the lifestyle that your kids may have is also important I knew for example that my daughter would very quickly get to the age where she would want a dressing table whereas you know my sons aren't really interested in a dressing table they want a place to be able to build Lego so you know just knowing what your kids need is a great way to to start but also in your space when you are thinking about yourself knowing all the different things that you do 
whether or not they've become habits over time, whether or not they are things that you'd rather do or rather not do, write them down. Make sure you know what you are doing on a daily basis in your room. And if you can't remember and you want to start sort of giving yourself ideas, keep a notepad by your bed. Write down your sort of daily nighttime routine and start to get to know yourself a little bit better from the perspective of your evening routines. There may be things that you don't want to do in that evening routine. And, you know, maybe this helps you to come out of that, whether it's looking at your phone or, I don't know, reading a little bit too long and, and, you know, wanting to cut that down. But just know what that sleep routine is, what the habits are in that room, whether it's morning or nighttime. And if you know who you are designing for and really know what they're doing in that bedroom space, then you can really design around that. Okay, finally, and I've promised this is the last one, it is bathrooms. Every bathroom is going to be completely different. And I say this because I honestly think the bathrooms are one of the most important spaces in the house. In today's world, they are even becoming mini spas. I mean, we use them for everything. Again, really understanding what you want to use that space, how you want to do that, and the how will come when you know what you want to do and who is using that space. Now, I'm just gonna give you one example. My bathroom needs to to be used by two people, myself and my husband. I know that we have very different habits in our bathroom. He is a big splasher. I am neat and tidy when it comes to water. <laughs> I think just knowing that and preempting the potential conversations that will come, which is, oh my goodness, I've stepped in with my socks and I'm completely drenched. Get yourself a bathroom mat or make sure there are two sink areas so that actually if his area is completely splashed out, Mine is easy and doesn't have anything that's going to bother me and I can use my space as I would like to. You know, you can have a bathroom that's used by two people, but that is still very separate. Knowing that that is going to be an issue in the future, then you can future-proof that particular issue. I cannot know what all the things are that you do in your bathroom. You know, some people like to use their bathroom as a getaway space to have some clear time. Some people even read a book in their bathrooms. Some people have enough space in their bathrooms that they can have a small chair or even a sofa. So if that's you and you're using it more like a spa than a bathroom, then again, just knowing that and knowing what you want to do when you're there really will help how you achieve that if you are somebody that does want to use it in a spa-like way and you don't have that much space then what you can do is rather than adding in a chair that doesn't fit or a little bench you can create a spa-like environment so yes you can do it simply by adding candles you can really look at the way you're presenting that bathroom from an accessory point of view you can use calming colors in the bathroom you can use some natural elements so again you can bring in baskets you can and potentially not have full porcelain or marble or tiles everywhere. You can break that up so that it feels a little bit softer. There are so many things that you can do that inspire what you want in your bathroom, but you've got to know what you want to do there first. I think the other how is going to be things like knowing that you do want to read or you do want to take your coffee in in the morning. Do you have somewhere to place it? Do you have somewhere where you are going to store extra towels because you're a family that, you know, needs two or three towels every time you have a bath? Is there a system whereby you are able to dry your towels if you use lots of towels? It's knowing what you need. And again, the solution comes very quickly after that. I was asked a very funny question the other day and actually it was from a good friend of my mother's and she said to me, Noor, I watched your Instagram video. I had said, you know, if you're a particularly tall person, then you should be careful about the height of your shower head and, you know, potentially have a higher shower head. And if you were a much smaller person, then you should consider having a lower shower head or even potentially having a shower that has an arm out of the wall. And she said to me, but I'm tiny and everyone else in my family is really tall. So of course it made us laugh and it was a wonderful story, but it made me think that actually, you know, that's so important. There might not be an either or. There might be a situation where there has to be a compromise or that actually you need to find a different kind of solution. But the fact that she recognized that and she said to me, look, this is clearly a problem. If you know that in advance of building your bathroom, you are going to be in much better shape 
to be able to produce something that is right for you. I don't know whether she has a big bathroom or a small bathroom. If she has enough space, then potentially she can have two different levels. There are probably today shower heads that you can pull down, shower heads that pull back up. There is so much technology out there. There is probably a solution for everyone and everything. But knowing that that is your issue is great because it then allows you to future-proof how you design that bathroom. Within that same line of conversation and thinking about, for example, children, then, you know, again, you do need to consider how are my kids going to use the bathroom you know and they use it in a very different way to us not everybody but generally kids can be a little bit more messy have you facilitated their ability to be a bit tidier in that bathroom space are there places where they can reach for things easily are there enough towel storage areas you know have you enabled them to be able to use their bathroom just as well as you have been able to use yours. I think making sure that not necessarily that you put everything at a lower place because of course it's crazy to then change that three, four years later, but just making sure that you look at your kids' habits, you look at the future of what their habits might be and allow for that within your design. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have not already, please do subscribe and like this video. It really is a pleasure to do these videos for you. I hope this has been helpful. If there are any questions that I can answer for you, please do leave your comments below and I will try to get back to all of them.